With everything moving to electric these days, the race to create a better power source is on, and billions have been spent in the pursuit. This is especially true when it comes to energy storage. By far the most popular type of battery right now is lithium ion. These come in a variety of different chemistries, and are favored because they can hold a large amount of energy in a relatively small space. They are not without their flaws, though, and you don't need to look hard to find them. One error in production, and all of your smartphones suddenly have a spontaneous combustion problem. On top of the fire hazard, the contents of these batteries are more than a little toxic, so it's no wonder that people are trying to replace them. But before we can understand the devices vying for their spot at the top, we first need to understand how batteries work. In energy storage, there are three main things that can take place to store power. The first are galvanic reactions. These are the sort that you find in a simple lemon battery. These occur between the electrode of the battery and the electrolyte they're in, and eventually destroy the electrodes. Then there are ferritic or electrochemical redox reactions. As an example of this, let's look at one of the oldest types of battery that's still in use, the lead-acid battery. Lead-acid batteries are the kind you find in most gas-powered vehicles, and have remained basically the same since they were invented back in 1859. In a lead-acid battery, there are two electrodes, one made of pure lead, and the other made of lead oxide. These electrodes are suspended in a fairly concentrated sulfuric acid solution. When you take power out of the battery, the sulfuric acid reacts with the electrodes and converts both the lead and lead oxide into lead sulfate. When the battery is recharged, this reaction happens in reverse, regenerating the sulfuric acid and converting the electrodes back into lead and lead oxide. This principle of reversible reactions is the heart of most battery chemistry. The reactions are slow, which allow the batteries to put out a constant stream of power for a long time. The final method of energy storage is called electrostatic. This is the type that you most often find in capacitors. Instead of reactions with the electrodes where things are converted chemically, power is stored by moving ions from one electrode to the other and having them cluster near the electrode surface. Technically, you don't even need an electrolyte for this to happen, and many types of capacitors are totally dry. Unlike galvanic storage or ferritic storage, these sorts of reactions can release the, all of their energy very quickly. This makes them useful when you want a lot of power all at once, but isn't great for powering your phone for a long time. Now, let's compare a lead-acid battery to a standard old-school lithium-ion battery. Here there are two electrodes made of cobalt oxide on one side and graphite on the other. Rather than simply being suspended in a solution, they're held apart by a separator or membrane to prevent the electrodes from touching, and everything is soaked in an electrolyte solution. The electrolyte is a lithium salt usually dissolved in organic solvent. In its empty state, the lithium ions in solution stick to the graphite electrode. When you put electricity into the battery, lithium ions move across the membrane to the other side and form lithium cobalt oxide. When energy is used, the ions are released and travel back across the membrane and stick to the graphite again. More modern cells use things other than cobalt oxide and are far safer because of it. So what are the downsides? The lithium that runs the cells is itself toxic and is becoming more and more expensive as we mine more of it. The solvents used are highly flammable, and the worst can release things like hydrofluoric acid if they get too hot. And because everything inside is flammable and you're storing massive amounts of energy in such a small space, a short can cause the cells to fail violently. This also makes them non-ideal for medical applications as the electrolyte is seriously damaging if it leaks, or if the cells short while implanted. Finally, you may have noticed that they degrade pretty quickly over time, so after a year or two your laptop or phone that used to last for 8-12 to 12 hours only lasts for 4. So what are our other options? What could hold the power of a lithium battery or more without the inherent risks or degradation issues? Well, by far one of the most exciting options is supercapacitors. The promises of supercapacitors are large, but the quest to make them reach their full potential has been and will be a long one. Unlike most batteries, supercapacitors can usually be cycled thousands of times without degradation issues, and theoretically they could hold far more power. They also have incredibly high power density owing to the fact that they use both ferritic and electrostatic reactions. So building an array that can literally melt a crowbar is totally possible. Also, since they work using a totally different mechanism, it opens the chemistry up to a whole host of new and interesting options. This means that a cell that is totally non-toxic and could last for years without degrading is theoretically possible. It may even be cheaper if no lithium or other expensive elements are used. For the past few years, that's the goal I've been chasing, and while I'm making a lot of progress fairly quickly, there's still a long way to go. So in this video, I wanted to take you through some of the very basics of supercapacitors, and how you can experiment with these amazing little devices at home. 
This is sort of like the supercapacitor family tree. As you can see, there's lots of variability, but three main groups. For this video, we're only going to be looking at the most standard, which are called electric double layer capacitors. To build one, you first need two current collectors, which are just conductive materials, usually foils, that allow you to get power in and out of the device. Then we have the two electrodes. Here's where things get weird. The first electrode is the material you coat the current collector in, usually an activated carbon or graphene or something similar. The second is actually the electrolyte. This is because of the electrostatic nature of these devices. When you put power into the device, ions in the electrolyte cluster near the current collector, forming a layer which is how the power is stored. The other way power is stored is through intercalation reactions. These are similar to what we used in previous videos to make graphene, but in this case we're putting far less power into the system, so the intercalated ions don't damage the electrode material. In these sorts of reactions, ions fit in between and amongst the structure of the electrode material. For example, if graphite is used, this would mean that ions are going between the layers and getting stuck temporarily. This process is slower to release, which extends the amount of time the cell is putting out power, making it act more like a battery. There's actually a whole host of other reactions and effects that contribute to the total energy storage, but for the sake of this video, we're going to stick to this simplistic view. Since these devices are usually made by putting two sets of coated current collectors facing each other and separated by a membrane, this actually means that the cell is really two capacitors in series. This lowers the overall capacitance but increases the voltage, because of the way capacitors in series add together. This is one reason why practical and theoretical values for these devices may differ, but the stored energy should be similar. You can get around this by only coating one electrode, but then you're getting into the territory of asymmetric capacitors, which come with their own challenges which are beyond the scope of this video. To get a feel for these devices, let's build a really simple one. We'll start with our plates, and there's a very wide array of options. I find that regular aluminum foil is always a good choice to start if you've got nothing else. However, what I usually use is a material called graphoil, which is the same stuff that I used in the graphite synthesis video. I like it because it's chemically very inert, so I can use whatever electrolyte I want without risking it degrading. Also, because it's made of graphite, you get an added little boost of intercalation reactions. But I encourage you to experiment. You may and probably will find that different kinds of metal plates may work better for the battery chemistry that you're using. Now we need to coat our plates with our electrode material. To keep things simple, we'll be using ordinary graphite powder for this, though there's lots of things that can and probably should be used in its place. Activated carbons are by far the most common, though graphene and the like are becoming more popular. The main thing to keep in mind is you want a material that's highly conductive, has as high a surface area as physically possible, and controlled porosity to allow the ions to move around at just the right rate. To get the electrode material to stick to the current collector, we need to make it into a sort of paint. To make a good electrode paint, there's lots of things you need to keep in mind. The first is the amount and type of binder that you use. Unless you're using conductive polymers as your binder, almost anything else will increase the resistance of your paint. And subsequently, the internal resistance which will lead to higher losses in your cell and lower power density. So you never want to use more than about 10% binder by weight in your paint. Also, your binder shouldn't be soluble in the electrolyte solution you're going to be using, or it'll just fall off the plates and make a mess. So your paint binder and solvent should take this into account. The most common binders are PVDF, PVP, and PVA, though there's a huge selection of alternatives like chitosan, casein, shellac, urethanes, and more. For this video, we'll be using casein, which is a protein from milk, and some white glue, also known as polyvinyl acetate. To make a batch of paint, we weigh out 5 grams of casein and 3 grams of PVA and add them to a beaker. Then we add 100 milliliters of water and 20 milliliters of 70% isopropyl alcohol, then simply stir to combine. I like this binder because it's a good middle-of-the-road binder. The casein prevents it from falling apart too much if you use a water-based electrolyte, and this mix doesn't interfere with the conductivity too much. But it is far from perfect, so I'd suggest experimenting with other binders as well that suit your chemistry. The graphite you use should be pretty fine so your paint isn't chunky. Here I'm adding 36 grams of graphite to our binder solution, and again we mix to combine. If you have one, you can ball mill the paint for a slightly more even consistency, but I'm not going to bother for this batch because the graphite on its own mixes in very well. Now we can use this paint to coat our plates. Here I'm laying down 2 cm wide strips on some graphite foil, which then get cut into individual 2 cm square pieces with a little tab left uncoated for electrical contact. Finally, we need an electrolyte. 
By far the most common is 1 molar sulfuric acid, as it provides a lot of hydrogen ions to participate in the electrostatic reactions. But you can use neutral or even basic electrolytes. Here let's compare 1 molar phosphoric acid and 1 molar sodium sulfate. To test our cells, we're going to need to assemble them. To do this, we put one of our finished electrodes face up on the bench. Then we put a small piece of our separator material on top, so that it covers the electrode material and leaves the tab uncovered so we can connect to it later. Here I'm using some thin tissue paper, but most types of paper work well as separators. For more advanced cells, especially those based on organic electrolytes, things like Nafion and other plastics can be used instead. For our cells, this really is just here to prevent the electrodes from touching, so what you use doesn't really matter. You can not use any paper and use a gelled electrolyte instead if you prefer. These are the basis for solid state cells, but we'll talk more about those in future videos. Then we put a few drops of our test electrolyte onto the paper, and then place another electrode face down and turned 180 degrees on top, making sure to line up the painted area. And that's it, our cells are assembled. Now let's take them for a test drive. To test our little supercapacitors, we're going to need a few things. The first is a variable power supply. If you're going to be working on supercapacitors, these are absolutely necessary. Then we'll need a multimeter, an LED, a 100 to 1000 ohm resistor, and a timer. When we're testing these devices, there's a few values that we're interested in. The first is the peak voltage, or the breakdown voltage, which is where the cell sits once it's charged. This value is dependent both on the electrolyte that you're using and the electrode material. As a quick test to see approximately how well the cell is performing, I'd like to charge it up and then discharge it through an LED and see how long it keeps it lit. But for a more accurate measure of how the cell is performing, we're going to measure its capacitance. To do this, we charge the cell up to some voltage, I like to use the peak voltage for this, and then measure how long the cell takes to reach some lower voltage while being discharged through a resistor of known resistance. Here I'm using a 1000 ohm resistor. Then we plug our values into this formula, and out pops the capacitance. This is really a slightly rough estimate, as secondary effects can screw with the number, but it's still a good test. Let's try this with our test cells. First up, the phosphoric acid. I'm charging the cells with 3 volts and 1 amp, which is technically a little bit high and may damage the electrolyte a little bit. First, the peak voltage. You'll notice it doesn't really sit at a number and drops off pretty quickly. Let's do that again with the sodium sulfate. This time it's much slower to drop, but again, it doesn't really sit anywhere for too long. This is because of the low capacitance of the cells and internal leakage. But of the two, the sodium sulfate was better. Now the LED test. Let's watch these side by side. It's a bit light in this room, so it can be difficult to see the end of the test, and this is all pretty relative, but I tried to stop the test at the same level of brightness for both. Here the clear winner is the sodium sulfate. The LED stayed lit for far longer. And finally, let's measure the capacitance. For the phosphoric, after charging, I chose to connect the resistor when the voltage hit 1.5 volts and started the timer. I stopped the time when it hit 0.5 volts. I do this to try and keep a difference of 1 volt to make the math easy. You may find that different pairs of values give you slightly different answers. It took 68 seconds to hit the bottom voltage, so when we plug that into our capacitance formula, we get a value of 0.068 farads, or 68 millifarads. Doing that again with the sodium sulfate, I started at 1.6 volts and stopped at 0.6 volts. This took 82 seconds this time. So after plugging it into the formula, we get 0.09 farads. If you're really serious about making these sorts of devices, you'll want to change one variable at a time and do little tests like this over and over and over again. Maybe you made a really cool activated carbon or a fancy electrolyte. Make a little test cell, run these tests, see how it stacks up, write down your results. Repeat, 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 until you've developed a cell that works really well. Before we wrap up, I want to show you what happens if we only change one thing, which is switching out the graphite. This cell is based on an activated carbon I'm working on and uses a water-based electrolyte. Here's its peak voltage. Right off the bat, you can see it sits much higher and doesn't drop the way our earlier test cells do. And here's a sped up LED test. Notice that it's far better than the plain graphite and keeps the LED lit for at least 12 minutes. The LED was still lit when I stopped the test, but it was getting pretty dim. Finally, when the capacitance is measured, it gives a value of 0.6 farads. If you're interested in these sorts of devices and want to learn more, I can't recommend Robert Murray Smith's channel enough. He does amazing work and has a huge selection of videos showing how to make a wide range of materials, electrolytes, and cell designs. So be sure to check him out. 
Beyond that, there are literally thousands of papers on the subject, so head over to Sci-Hub and get reading. But take it slow, as the sheer volume of information can be overwhelming. In future videos, we'll explore the rest of the supercapacitor family tree and the intersections between traditional batteries and supercapacitors. So be sure to check back every other Monday for all of that.